Hello everyone, Dr. Polaris here. After the extinction of the non-avian dinosaurs at the end of the Cretaceous period, placental mammals exploded in terms of diversity, successfully moving into the niches left open by the passing of the great reptiles. This would of course mean that mammals took over the ecological role of specialised herbivores from the hadrosaurs, ceratopsians and titanosaurs with several different lineages emerging to fill this gap in the ecosystem. On the northern continents of Eurasia and North America, it would be the hoofed artiodactyls, perissodactyls and their relatives that became the dominant herbivorous groups, with these producing everything from horses to pigs to antelopes. In South America, the ever mysterious meridiungulates filled similar roles, with at least some of them seemingly being closely related to perissodactyls. On the semi-isolated continent of Afro-Arabia, however, things would play out differently. The ungulates of the northern continents were absent, and would not arrive until the early Miocene, about 22 million years ago. In their place, a lineage of successful herbivorous Afrotheres emerged, the pain ungulates, which went on to produce a whole host of forms, including the extinct rhino-like embrythopods, the aquatic Cyrenians, the famous trunked Propocidians, and the subject of today's video, the Hyraxes. These small, stocky, and quite cute herbivores can be found across much of the African continent today, with their somewhat guinea pig-like appearance making their close relationship to elephants and Cyrenians difficult to appreciate at first. However, if we look more closely at the internal anatomy and biology of Hyraxes, then the similarities are pretty striking. Despite looking like rodents, Hyraxes lack claws but instead possess blunt, hoof-like nails, similar to those of elephants and manatees. In addition, males lack a scrotum and keep their genitalia up within their bodies, while the females have teats located near their armpits. These are traits also seen in elephants and sirenians, as is the possession of highly charged myoglobin in their blood, which suggests that all of these animals evolved from semi-aquatic ancestors. Hyraxes also have enlarged upper incisors, but these are not used for chewing in the same way as those of rodents, with these functioning as tusks for display, very much as in elephants. This contrasts with most other mammals, which have tusks formed from their canines instead. Phylogenetic studies have shown that hyracoids first appeared during the Paleocene, with fossil evidence demonstrating that early members of Proboscidea had appeared in North Africa by at least 61 million years ago. As hyracoids are more basal than their trunked cousins, then it stands to reason that they were also around at this time as well, although the oldest known fossils stem from the early Eocene, about 55 million years ago. Some early forms were tiny, being little bigger than rats, although they would still have generally resembled modern species. Most of these basal forms are represented by pretty scrappy remains, usually only teeth and parts of postcranial material, and as such there are very few depictions of them online. Some, such as Microhyrax, were quite similar to living forms, while others were more specialised. Geniohyus, for example, possessed cheek teeth similar to those of pigs, and were probably well adapted for crushing hard fruits, roots and tubers. In addition, while modern forms are small, guinea pig-sized animals, some ancient Cenozoic genera were much larger, and filled many ecological roles taken by artiodactyls and perissodactyls on the northern continents. The Oligocene Megalohyrax, which is native to what is now Egypt, Ethiopia and Saudi Arabia, lived in warm tropical forests and browsed on foliage. About the size of a modern tapir, measuring at least 1.5 metres long and probably weighing between 180 and 300 kilograms or up to 661 pounds, Megalohyrax would have lived much like a tapir as well. Unlike its modern relatives, this animal had a long, low skull with an elongated snout, being well adapted for selective browsing. Another very large form, Titanohyrax, was also native to North Africa, albeit earlier during the Eocene, and dying out by the end of the Oligocene. Although known from rare and very scrappy remains, the youngest known species, T. ultimus, was clearly the largest hyracoid to ever live, with the animal being comparable to a modern Sumatran rhino in terms of size weighing between 600 kilograms and 1.3 metric tons. Up to five species have been described, with some, such as T. tantulus, being far smaller, weighing only 23 kilograms or 51 pounds. All share similar relatively high crowned selenodont molars, 
which suggests a largely foliverous diet of soft leaves. While Titanohyrax often went for large size, its close relative Antillohyrax was specialised for speed and agility. Native to Egypt during the late Eocene and Oligocene, between 34 to 28 million years ago, this long-legged animal stood about 50 centimetres or 1.8 feet tall at the shoulder, and would have resembled a small hornless modern deer. Like Titanohyrax, it was a selective browser, feeding on leaves and tender young shoots, but would have utilised a quick turn of speed in order to escape from hyenodont predators. By the early Miocene, Afro-Arabia had collided with Eurasia, which led to a period of extended faunal interchange between the land masses. The northern artiodactyls, perissodactyls, carnivorans among others, moved south into Africa for the first time, while aardvarks, proboscideans, and of course the hyraxes moved north into Eurasia. While competition from the highly specialised bovid artiodactyls put pressure on African hyraxes, leading to a reduction in their overall diversity, the group was still widespread during the Miocene and Pliocene, being found from Spain to China in addition to their African homeland. The pig-sized genus Pliohyrax was found across the savannah woodlands of Miocene and Pliocene Eurasia, where it fed on low-growing vegetation. Meanwhile, the superficially hippo-like Kvabebi hyrax was endemic to the Caucasus region during the Pliocene, a semi-aquatic animal with eyes positioned at the top of its head and possessing a flexible upper lip or even a short trunk. It was about the size of a small modern tapir and would have looked quite a lot like the early proboscideans such as Merotherium. By the early Pleistocene, hyracoids had declined quite significantly, with the group dying out in Europe and much of the Middle East, probably mainly as a result of climatic changes and perhaps also competition with bovids. In Asia, hyracoids persisted a little longer, with the genus Proschizotherium dwelling in the Trans-Baikal region of eastern Russia until the early Pleistocene, circa 2.5 million years ago. This was the last of the big hyracoids, standing about 70 centimeters tall and weighing as much as an adult human, maxing out at around 80 kilograms or almost 200 pounds. Today, only three genera of hyrax remain, all of which are quite small and are now restricted to Africa, the Arabian Peninsula, and the Levant. All of these are members of the family Procaviidae, which diverged from all of the fossil forms mentioned earlier during the Eocene. The type genus Procavia, also known as the Rock Hyrax, has a wide range encompassing most of the Sahara, the coastal regions of Arabia and the Levant, as well as the southern tip of Africa. Like all modern Procaviids, it is a stocky, superficially guinea pig-like animal that weighs around 4 kilograms or 8.8 .8 pounds on average. Living in large groups that range from 10 to 80 individuals, rock hyraxes unsurprisingly favour rocky mountainous habitats up to 13,000 feet above sea level, where their padded feet and agility allow them to escape from the many predators that hunt them, such as eagles, leopards, caracals and pythons. These animals feed on a variety of plant matter and are active mostly in the morning and daytime, often being seen to huddle together as part of their complex thermoregulatory cycle. They are highly social, with the youngsters engaging in play fighting, which will prepare them for the strong bonds within the group as adults. The rock hyrax is closely related to the similar looking yellow spotted rock hyrax of the genus Heterohyrax. It's a native to eastern and southern Africa, also favouring high rocky cliffs and bluffs. They have a mostly browsing diet and spend up to 95% of the day resting and sunbathing in the mornings and evenings, which puts them at risk from predators. However, the dominant male of the group will keep watch from a high rock and lets out a shrill warning call if he spots danger. If grabbed by a predator, they will deliver many aggressive bites utilising their sharp tusks. The third living genus is Dendrohyrax, which inhabits the tropical forests of Western and Central Africa in addition to the more open savanna woodlands of the eastern continent. Unlike the other two genera, this form lives mostly in trees and is largely nocturnal, feeding on leaves, buds and flowers up in the canopy. Living either alone or in small groups, tree hyraxes are fantastic climbers despite their rotund appearance, and are actively uncomfortable when forced to the ground. The males are territorial, and their blood-curdling shrieks and screams echo through the night as a warning to rivals. 
In many ways, hierarchoids have a similar history to the sloths of South America. Both were highly diverse groups earlier in the Cenozoic, developing on semi-isolated island landmasses, and successfully spreading out once their respective homelands collided with the northern continents. However, beyond the Pleistocene, both groups declined significantly in diversity, with only a small number of modestly sized species remaining. Oh, and living sloth and hyraxes are also pretty cute. Thanks for watching, everyone. The next episode will be covering the Litopterns, a famous lineage of South American meridiungulates that tended to resemble horses, deer, and camels. See you again soon. Cheerio.